Hi, it's Katrina. Underwater people. The Bajau people of Southeast Asia have developed an incredible genetic adaptation. Their bodies have actually changed to be able to survive longer underwater, like a superpower. A new study has proven that these people have developed larger spleens in order to help them dive, so they can hold their breath for longer. For generations, the Bajau have survived by diving and collecting shellfish off the ocean floor. To understand why this adaptation occurred, we need to look at the history of these ancient people. The Bajau have traditionally been a nomadic and seafaring tribe, surviving off the ocean in coastal areas along the Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia. There are about one million of these people scattered throughout this part of the world, and for the past thousand years or so, they've been living on houseboats and traveling from place to place, living directly on the water and very rarely venturing to land. They get everything they need from the sea, and so as unbelievable as it may seem, their body has adapted to give them biological scuba tanks. It works like this. The spleen is an organ in the human body about the size of a fist. It removes old cells from the blood and helps cycle oxygen. When somebody is diving, they need more oxygen in their blood so that they can hold their breath for longer and dive deeper. The Bajau evolved to have bigger spleens so that they can dive underwater way longer than any other group of people, holding their breath for several minutes while diving to depths of over 210 feet. To compare, the average person can hold their breath for about a minute and dive to about 20 feet. The big mystery right now is that scientists don't understand if this is some kind of mutation, a process of evolution, or just what exactly is happening to turn these humans practically into mermaids and mermen, merpeople. The reverse flow of time. As much as we like to believe we know things, the truth is that we know very little, especially when it comes to something like the flow of time. Most scientists will agree that time moves only forward, but then there are people like Albert Einstein who said that time is nothing but an illusion. Well, actually, he wrote, the separation between past, present, and future is only an illusion, if a stubborn one. Today, a team of physicists has suggested that with better understanding of the quantum system, time could move both forward and backward. The reason time can only move forward is that the universe is a closed loop. Picture all of existence curled into a ball, and everything is moving perpetually forward. This suggests that the universe is never able to return to an earlier point. It only goes forward. But this doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Scientists from the University of Bristol say that space itself, light and particles, could theoretically evolve backward and forward at the same time. The only thing is that it would never affect human experience. We are considered macroscopic systems, unable to perceive quantum superpositions or temporal evolutions. Time for us can only move forward. But at the fundamental level of the world itself, constructed of quantum systems, things could move backward to a previous state. You could never actually go back to a previous point in time, like a specific date in history, but the universe could fold backward and push time with it. At least this is more or less what the scientists are saying. The truth is that they have no idea how in the world this would work, but they do know that backward flowing time does seem to be a possibility. Fungus on Mars. A team of fringe scientists used images taken by NASA's Opportunity rover to show the world that there are mushrooms on Mars. They say the fungi is direct evidence of life on the red planet. And although these scientists are at the very edge of acceptable research, and the notion of mushrooms on Mars seems ludicrous, their paper was accepted for publication in a peer-reviewed journal. The lead author of the study is Ron Joseph, a die-hard believer of life on Mars. Even though the bulk of the scientific community disagrees with him, claiming he's actually working against science, he's loud enough to draw a lot of attention to his theories. But here's the deal with the mushrooms. What Joseph saw in the images are probably just a bunch of rocks that kind of look like mushrooms. Even right here on Earth, finding mushrooms is pretty difficult. For mushrooms to grow, they need to be in a very specific environment, with the right temperature, the right amount of rainfall, and perfect humidity. On Mars, there is no rain or humidity. It's a barren desert devoid of life. Still, the issue is that the mushrooms in question are on another planet, and nobody can confirm or deny their existence. No scientist can prove one way or the other that mushrooms are growing on Mars. Venomous humans. 
If you've ever laid in bed at night and wondered why humans aren't venomous like rattlesnakes or scorpions, I have some good news for you. The truth is that humans could actually evolve to produce venom. Scientists with the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University looked at reptile and mammal DNA and discovered something shocking. It turns out both these classes of animals share the same genetic foundation needed to produce oral venom. What that means is that humans or elephants or what have you could become venomous in the future. It would take a few thousand years minimum, but it could definitely happen. The science is actually quite simple. When the team looked at the Taiwan Habu vipers, they compared certain genes that work alongside venom genes, things that protect cells from stress and regulate protein modification. When they cross-examined these genes with those of mammals, they found that we have our own versions of these genes. Plus, salivary glands tissue is quite similar to snake venom glands. What this means is that we have the same ancient foundation, one which could allow us to create venom in our saliva and spit at people. What scientists don't know is how exactly this could happen or how long it would take. They think that under certain ecological conditions, mice would probably be the most likely to start creating toxic proteins in their saliva. There's actually a chance that in a couple thousand years, mice and rats might be venomous like Komodo dragons. If you could produce toxic venom, would you? Or would you rather just keep your ordinary saliva? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Crop circles. Crop circles are real. It's a phenomenon that has puzzled scientists, intrigued the population, and freaked people out for decades. And while scientists frequently chalk crop circles up as pranks or hoaxes, the truth is that they don't know everything. First of all, crop circles are almost always found in the United Kingdom, specifically in the southwest of England. The earliest crop circles have been dated back to 1678. There is a legend from folklore which says an English farmer told one of his workers that he would rather pay the devil to cut his oat field than give the man the fee he wanted. And so Satan came up and cut his grass, leaving bizarre patterns to disturb the farmer. But it wouldn't be until 300 years later, in Australia in 1966, that a farmer in the town of Tully witnessed a flying saucer. He said the alien craft rose out of a swamp and flew off into the stars. When he went to investigate, he discovered a circular patch of flattened reeds and grass. Clearly, it had been made by an alien spaceship, and it was from this point on that crop circles became part of pop culture. Starting in the 1970s, simple circles began to form all throughout the English countryside. But the number of these strange circles and their complexity increased exponentially up until the 1990s, when the most elaborate were produced. These were crop circles illustrating insanely complicated mathematical equations. But by 2000, they had pretty much dropped off the map. We don't know if there was a rush of alien visitors for 30 years, if one group was responsible for the pranks, or if farmers were doing it themselves and simply got bored and stopped. What do you think crop circles are? Let me know in the comments below. The Appendix Scientists and doctors have wondered for many years why the appendix exists. Most think of it as a useless piece of evolution, kind of like the hind leg bones that some whales still have from their days of walking on land. But the appendix may just be on its way out. According to a report in the journal Case Reports and Surgery, one out of every 100,000 people are now being born without an appendix. That small, squiggly-shaped sac near the large intestine could, in a few generations, be a thing of the past. But why does the appendix even exist? Over 1 in 20 people get appendicitis when their appendix becomes inflamed, and if they don't remove it, they can die. It seems redundant to have an organ that kills 1 out of 20 humans without emergency surgery. Charles Darwin believed the appendix was an organ from when our ancestors ate leaves, which helped them digest food. Over a century later, in 2007, William Parker from Duke University School of Medicine discovered that the appendix could serve as a reservoir for gut bacteria to help food digestion. It's also become clear that the appendix has a high concentration of lymphoid tissue, which helps the immune system, and it's also true that the appendix has been inside mammalian bodies for 80 million years. Clearly, the appendix is used for something, it's just that scientists still can't figure out the full importance of it. We also don't know why more and more people are being born without it, or why it frequently self-destructs 
and tries to kill its host. Devolution Scientists have recently discovered that we have less DNA than our ancient ancestors, and they can't figure out why. In a new study, researchers found that human beings have been losing DNA ever since we evolved from apes. Even our most recent early human ancestors had substantially more genetic data than we do currently. This bizarre discovery has raised numerous questions, such as where did all that genetic information go? Why did it go in the first place? And what difference has it made? And unfortunately, scientists don't have the answer to any of these questions. The researchers were led by a professor named Evan Eichler from the Department of Genome Sciences at the University of Washington. He and his team sequenced the genomes of 236 different people from 125 different populations. The results showed that Homo sapiens as a whole have lost 40.7 million base pairs of DNA. This is over the past 13 million years. We still have 3 billion base pairs of DNA, but what in the world happened to the other 40 million? It could be junk DNA, things we didn't need that we shed over time, but at least 27.96 million of these base pairs were found to be unique, responsible for certain genetic traits that we don't know. So either we lost DNA that we didn't need, or as we move into the modern world, we are getting less advanced. Mother Meteor one of the most challenging things that scientists have tried and failed to figure out is where exactly the building blocks of human life came from. We know that there are four main building blocks of DNA, which are responsible for all life on the planet. These four main building blocks are the genetic makeup for everything that lives and breathes. And where these building blocks are, life typically follows. Although scientists can't say for sure where these blocks came from, they have gotten some new information that's turning the scientific community on its head. The four main building blocks, adenine, thymine, cystocyne, and guanine, have all been discovered in meteorites that impacted the Earth. In other words, the ingredients that make up every part of your body may have landed on the planet from outer space millions and millions of years ago. There is still a lot of information that needs to be analyzed, but right now, it really looks like our DNA came from outer space specifically from chemical reactions inside interstellar molecular clouds. One resilient community. A rural community in Ireland survived just about every threat thrown at it for a solid 1,000 years. The community lived through the European famine, the Black Death, the Irish potato famine, the warm medieval climate anomaly, and the Little Ice Age. But what really caught the attention of scientists was just how well the people in this tiny community fared during various plagues. Very few deaths were ever reported, and the people here almost seemed untouched by the larger disasters crippling Europe. This community is seemingly immune to death. Researcher Gil Plunkett from Queen's University Belfast studied the site up in Ireland's Antrim Hills. It's deserted today, nothing but a bog with a few abandoned houses and forgotten pieces of old farming equipment. But for 1,000 years, up until the 20th century, the community always had people in it. The residents only left in the 1900s in order to seek better opportunities in the modern world outside. Gill did a bunch of tests. He studied pollen, looked at peat core samples, figured out what plants they grew over the millennium, but there was nothing to say why the community remained impervious to every disaster that crippled everywhere else in Ireland. The only thing scientists can think of involves the one way in which this community was different from the rest. You see, there were no landlords. Up until the later part of the 1800s, right before everyone left, those in the community were free. They could change their lifestyle anytime, grow whatever crops they wanted, abandon farming altogether and go hunting, and never had to pay rent. This is the only thing they did differently, and they beat all the plagues and all the famines, defeated only by modern civilization. Tabby's Star Tabby's Star baffled astronomers for years. Scientists watched in disbelief and confusion as this star, located in the constellation Cygnus, became brighter, dimmer, and brighter again. Nobody could figure out why the star was fluctuating in its brightness. The thing is that stars are measured here on Earth by how bright they are, and the only reason their brightness dims is when a celestial object passes in front of them. But this was weird, because it was happening so frequently, it was almost as if satellites were moving in front of Tabby's star. 
Astronomers even suggested some kind of alien megastructure in the star's solar system that makes random passes in front of it. Recently, scientists decided it wasn't an alien megastructure after all, but just cosmic dust. The mystery had been ongoing since 2011, completely stumping astronomers for a whole decade. And now, all these years later, they say it's nothing so big and complicated as an artificial mothership, just dust. Huge clouds of dust floating in front of the star. But of course, this could all just be a cover story for a very real alien megaship. The Mysterious Sri Lankan Stargate Sri Lanka's mysterious stargate is located in the city of Anuradhapura. According to some, the stargate is a dormant portal from a long-lost time, one which supposedly has the power to send a person or another being spiraling through the universe. Of course, there is no real archaeological evidence for this, but that hasn't stopped the conspiracy theories from running wild. The city of Anuradhapura is an ancient wonder on its own, even without the stargate. It was the heart of Sri Lanka's early Buddhist culture, established as a holy city in the land of kings back in 377 BC. That's over 2,000 years ago. The sacred city contains within its borders an urban park from days long past, about 40 acres in size. The park is surrounded by three gigantic Buddhist temples, and it's inside this temple park where the stargate can be found, etched onto an ancient piece of stone. The name of the carving is Sakwala Chakraya, which translates to universe cycle. Archaeologists believe it might have been used as a star map or a primitive calendar. Others say the strange symbols and shapes within the circle are actually used to unlock the secrets of the universe and open the portal. Seeing as nobody's ever been able to open the portal in modern times, this may not be the case. It's still a major mystery, especially since nobody has any real clue what the function of the Sakwala Chakraya was. There are no historical records of it, and it's not mentioned in any ancient texts. Secret Underground World Underneath the crowded city streets of Beijing and China, there is an underground world, and it's home to about one million residents. It's a secret place built of concrete, which took shape back in the 1960s at the request of former president of the People's Republic of China, Mao Zedong. With the threat of the Cold War hovering over China's head, Mao decided to build a whole ton of concrete bunkers underneath Beijing to protect the most important people if a nuclear bomb fell. However, by the 1980s, the threat of nuclear war had pretty much evaporated, and so the bunkers weren't needed anymore. The government then converted the bunkers into things like shops and offices, and today they are also used as underground apartments. Living below ground may not be quite as cool as it sounds. The secret city beneath Beijing is populated primarily by migrant workers, students, and people who can't afford the rising cost of living above ground in Beijing. The price of a subterranean apartment is about one-third the cost of living above ground, although the conditions reflect the price. There's an estimated one million folks jammed into these underground bunkers like sardines in the dark. There are absolutely no foreigners allowed inside this secret place, but in December 2015, photographer Antonio Facilongo slipped past the guards and took some photographs. He shared the pictures with National Geographic and told the story of the people living there. Many of those he talked to were embarrassed because they told their families that they had good jobs, when in fact they were stuck under the city streets like sewer dwellers. And even though the city would like to prohibit living inside the shelters, it's too late, and they have nowhere to put the one million displaced citizens. The Secrets of the Massel Pit The Massel Pit in Germany is one of the most amazing secret places on the planet, filled to the brim with prehistoric fossils. It's located about 20 minutes from the city of Darmstadt, in the middle of the forest, where there stands a flooded strip mine half a mile wide. At first glance, the Missel Pit looks like an ordinary abandoned mine, but it's actually been a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1995, and its history goes back 48 million years. This was the Eocene period, when the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was significantly higher than today. The Arctic was a boiling swamp, where giant crocodiles lived, and Antarctica was covered in a tropical rainforest. 
The Himalayan mountains still hadn't been formed yet, and the world's oceans were 150 feet higher than today. That means that back in the day, Europe was just a stretch of water filled with many islands instead of a continuous landmass. In the Eocene period, the Macelle Pit was a deep lake two miles across. The lake likely bubbled with carbon dioxide, which killed animals who got too close. For years, creatures died and sank to the bottom of the lake, which preserved them miraculously in the sediment. When the mine closed down in the 1970s, the miners left and the dinosaur hunters arrived. Ever since, they've been pulling some of the most spectacular fossils out of the dried lake bed. Paleontologists have already identified almost 45 different mammal species among the thousands of specimens recovered. This lake was a real miracle, attracting a huge number of animals over millions of years and then killing them and preserving them like flowers that were pressed between the pages of a book. Thanks, Lake! The First Philistine Cemetery Archaeologists in Israel have recently come across the very first Philistine cemetery ever found. This is quite a big deal because for a very long time, historians have been trying to learn more about the Philistines, the villains in the Bible, best known for their giant warrior Goliath in the Book of Samuel. Sadly, there isn't much in the way of archaeological evidence for these people. It took researchers 30 years of exploring Ashkelon in southern Israel before they came across the cemetery, which is 3,000 years old. According to Daniel Master from Wheaton College, the cemetery is hopefully going to reveal much about the Philistines that nobody knew before. Archaeologists found skeletons buried in the graveyard, people put in the ground with jugs and bowls that had likely been filled with perfumed oil. Some skeletons wore bracelets and jewelry, while others were buried alongside weapons. Some people had also been cremated. Some bodies had been thrown into pits, while others were placed neatly into multi-chambered tombs. It's pretty odd because it doesn't only show one single way of burying the dead, but many. This means everything we thought we knew about Philistine burial customs is wrong and needs to be rewritten. Then there's Ashkelon itself a mysterious city whose secrets we still haven't completely unraveled. It's one of just five cities that belonged to the Philistines 3,000 years ago, a major hub on the Mediterranean for trade. However, during the Crusades, the city was destroyed, and much of its ancient history was lost. The City of Jinns Bala Fort, located in the highlands of Jebel Akhdar in Oman, is a mysterious place steeped in legends of spells, black magic and myth. Some call it the City of Jinns or the City of Magic, and people have been living here since roughly 500 BC. Although the fort itself was built starting in the 12th century AD by the Banu Nebhan Desert Tribe, it was also rebuilt multiple times and was finally renovated and opened to the public in May of 2012. Omani locals believe the fortress is the epicenter of all paranormal activity in the country. There are multiple legends, like the one that says that 1,400 years ago, a man was stoned to death by the villagers for practicing wizardry. This dead wizard then turned into a jinn or a spirit and now haunts the city. There is also a tree growing in the citadel which supposedly bestows an untimely death upon any foreigner who touches it, as it had been tainted by yet another sorcerer. Any creepy story the villagers could think of, they passed it along. The tall walls and strong towers of Bala Fort grew until most of the people living nearby simply left it alone to decay naturally. Do you believe in the existence of black magic? Let us know what you think in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Psychedelic Salt Mine 650 feet underneath Yekaterinburg in Russia is a place called the Psychedelic Salt Mines. The mines feature mind-bending natural formations that formed millions of years ago. The walls are brightly colored in yellows and whites, reds and blues, with the colors swirling in and out of each other in a psychedelic mixture unlike anything else seen on Earth. The long and winding tunnels of the mine are like a free acid trip, like rivers of color had actually dried and then been preserved in the rock. In truth, that is kind of what happened. The unbelievable swirls of color are there thanks to the layers of mineral carnalite. It's totally natural and more than a bit trippy. The mine was originally used to harvest salt, but most of the operations have ceased 
and now the miles and miles of twisting passageways are totally abandoned. However, nobody is allowed in without government permission, and so this is one secret place you probably won't be visiting. And besides, the tunnels are pitch black, and the air is full of tiny salt particles. These salt particles create a feeling in your throat like you're parched in the desert without any water. The Secret Throne of the Knights Templar One of the most mysterious strongholds of the Knights Templar is hiding underneath the cobblestone streets of Paris. Historians believe it was once their mightiest fortress, a place which these days isn't nearly as imposing as it once was. The fortress was built in the 13th century in a small part of Paris that was actually covered completely by a swamp. It was a gigantic fortification, with a great tower, turrets for defense, and high walls to keep everyone out. After the Templars were gone, the fortress fell into disrepair. It was used briefly to jail the French royal family during the French Revolution, and then was demolished by Napoleon III in 1853. These days, the stronghold is gone. A park was established over its remains in 1857, today called the Square du Temple. Many people who dine at the fancy cafes have no idea that they are sipping coffee at the exact place where the Knights Templar held their most secretive meetings. And since the entire area is now covered in stones and brick, there is no real way to see what's underneath. That said, experts believe there could in fact be secret underground chambers or passageways that never got destroyed, but were built over as Paris moved into the modern age. Fontanelle Cemetery Caves The Fontanelle Cemetery Caves in Naples is one of the most secretive and disturbing places in all of Italy. It's an ancient European ossuary, one which began as a secondary burial ground in the 1500s. This was a time when the churchyards and cemeteries were overflowing, and many European countries didn't know what to do. In Naples, the solution was to temporarily dispose of corpses inside of a cave on the outskirts of town. It started when the Spanish occupied Naples in the 1500s, and then the caves really took off during the plague outbreak of 1656. Bodies were dumped into the caves all the way into the 1830s with the cholera epidemics. But 1656 was definitely the worst, seeing as the plague killed about half the population of Naples, or 150,000 people. It took an entire generation for the city to recover socially and economically. With so many bodies being in the caves, the whole area soon took on a dark aura for the townsfolk. It became known as a haunted place, somewhere filled with the tormented souls of those who never received proper burial and were stuck in purgatory. Then, when Naples was hit by an extraordinarily heavy rain, the city was flooded and the cave poured out skulls and bones into the streets. Finally, in 1872, the anonymous remains were catalogued and organized. Everything was buried, and the dead were placed into their own boxes or crypts. Even today, people go to the Fontanelle crypts to ask the dead for favors, and to place wishes on small rolls of paper into their empty eye sockets. Goblin Valley Goblin Valley State Park is by far one of the stranger places in Utah, and one with an epic history. The park's scenery is stunning, and it has plenty of outdoor activities for a family of adventurers. It lies deep in the San Rafael Desert, and is home to thousands of goblins. Not real goblins, of course, but rock-shaped goblins. There is a section of the park filled with soft sandstone formations which have eroded over many thousands of years. The erosion has created squat, goblin-looking rocks that look ominous in the dark like an army of marching monsters. But in fact, these formations are called hoodoo rocks, and they're completely natural. But Goblin Valley State Park is more than just a collection of rocks. There is also evidence that Native American tribes lived here a very long time ago. There are pictographs and petroglyph panels here, which were left over from a variety of ancient cultures. The Paiute tribes made artwork here, as did the Ute and the Fremont. Secret Cave Chamber In Gibraltar, a mysterious cave chamber was sealed completely off by sand for about 40,000 years. This chamber is located deep in the back of the Vanguard Cave, and it had been lived in by Neanderthals prior to being sealed shut. At least that's according to Clive Finlayson from the Gibraltar National Museum, 
who was studying the cave when he came across the lost chamber. It was about 43 feet long, filled with eerie stalactites hanging from the ceiling. Clive and his team of scientists were also surprised to discover the bones and ancient remains of animals, such as hyenas and griffin vultures, as well as gigantic sea snails called whelk. The researchers also discovered a tooth from a four-year-old Neanderthal in this same cave a few years ago, and they think the child was a victim of a hyena attack. But the snails proved significantly harder to place, because hyenas didn't eat snails, and they wouldn't have carried something from the sea all the way into a dark cave chamber. That was something only a Neanderthal would have done. Researchers believe Neanderthals had lived inside the cave over 40,000 years ago. They wandered out in the daytime to collect snails, then retreated into the safety and cozy darkness of the secret cavern, like the womb of the earth. The Kachina Prophecy In Hopi mythology, the blue star Kachina is a spirit that will supposedly signify the coming of the beginning of the new world. It will appear in the sky as a bright blue star and will be the ninth and final sign before the apocalypse. The Kachina prophecy is almost like the prophecy of the end of days we see in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. The Hopi Native Americans lived mostly in the southwestern United States prior to the invasion of America by the Europeans. These days, there are an estimated 19,000 Hopi left in the country, living primarily in Arizona on the Hopi Reservation. They have an extraordinary belief system, and even though the Hopi may have changed a lot over the past few hundred years, their original legends live on. Frank Waters, who studied Hopi legends extensively, reported many of his findings in the mid-1900s. The Hopi believed in a great creator named Taiwa. It was said that at the beginning of time, nine universes were created, two for the gods and seven for the other forms of life. The first of the three worlds have already been inhabited and destroyed because they grew wicked and corrupt. Each time one of the worlds is destroyed, the few faithful Hopi are saved and then placed in the next world to try again. The Hopi allegedly believe that we are currently living in the fourth world and that it's only a matter of time before it too is destroyed by humanity's own darkness. This destruction will be heralded by the blue star Kachina. It will appear in the sky as a bright blue star, and the day of purification will begin. Sheep and Trees For centuries, people believed that lambs grew on trees. In the Jewish Talmud, written in 436 AD, there is mention of a plant-like animal in the form of a lamb. From this stem was grown a living and breathing baby sheep, just like a gourd attached to a long stalk growing out of the dirt. These creatures supposedly grew in the land of Tartary, where Turkey is today. In 1887, Henry Lee put together all the insane historical accounts of the lamb plant into a book and published it. The vegetable lamb supposedly sprouted from melon-like seeds and would form a biologically living animal, complete with flesh, blood, and bones. People believed the stem acted as the umbilical cord and that it kept the lamb hovering just a few inches above the ground. The stem was bendable, so the lamb could move around and eat whatever plants were nearby. However, once it ran out of nearby plants, it would slowly shrivel and die. It could be plucked from its stem and cooked, and its blood allegedly tasted like honey. People in Europe used to believe the vegetable lamb of Tartary was a delicacy, but it most likely never existed at all. In reality, the legend started with rumors of the cotton plant, which Northern Europeans never would have seen before. They thought the cotton plant was an actual sheep growing from the ground. Weighing the Soul in 1907, Dr. Duncan McDougall of Massachusetts tried to do something unprecedented. He performed a series of experiments meant to physically weigh the human soul. Duncan believed that the human soul had mass and that it could physically be studied using traditional methods. This was not an entirely new idea, since people have always believed in spirits. Some believe spirits occupied a particular place within the body, and it only makes sense that the human soul should be a real and tangible thing. 
Duncan put together a special bed fitted with beam scales. Then he convinced terminally ill people to lie down on the bed as they died. Duncan recorded the time of death, changes in weight, losses of bodily fluid and sweat, and even loss of gas. Throughout all his experimenting, he learned that the human soul weighs approximately 21 grams. This was such a big deal in the early 1900s that the New York Times did a story on it. However, it wasn't a very nice story, and Dr. Duncan was utterly ripped apart by other scientists who denounced him as a fraud. To this day, nobody's ever been able to figure out if the human soul really does have any weight to it. Blasphemous Forks the fork is the newest conventional utensil, and it was only in the 19th century that it was brought to dinner tables all over the United States. Up until that point, the fork was seen as something of pure evil. People believed the fork was both blasphemous, a slight against God, and effeminate, not something to be used by men. It's impossible to say exactly where the first fork was invented. However, it seems to first appear in the 11th century in the Byzantine Empire. A gold fork with only two prongs was used by a Byzantine princess named Maria Argyropolina. And while this may have seemed like a logical move, it was instantly bashed by Catholic society. Sarah Coffin, an expert in ancient history, says the fork was not associated with Christian values because it didn't seem like something that was essential to life. The princess who started using the fork supposedly died from the plague as divine punishment. This is a legend, and we don't know how much of it is historically accurate. What we do know is that in the 11th century, forks were frowned upon as hedonistic. Europeans ate strictly with their fingers and knives and slurped soup from communal bowls. Anyone who used a fork may as well have openly worshipped the devil. It wasn't until the 16th century that the fork became commonplace in Europe. It was popular in Italy because they needed it to eat pasta and spaghetti. The fork was modified multiple times. Aliens in Ancient Greece Greek philosophers began speculating about life beyond Earth in the 4th century BC. One of the first real believers in extraterrestrials was a man named Anaximander, who lived between 610 and 546 BC. His groundbreaking proposition was that the Earth was hanging in an infinite void, held up by absolutely nothing, and hovering in the vast emptiness of space. He was a lot closer to the truth than he realized and instinctively understood more about the universe than scientists would for thousands of years. As Greek philosophers talked more about the possibilities of what lurked out in the universe, they began to discuss extraterrestrial beings. The philosopher Metrodorus of Lampascus believed our world was one of many. He said the chance of a single world with life on it was the same as finding a single ear of wheat growing in a vast plain. In other words, he believed it was highly unlikely that ours was the only world out there. Even the Roman poet Lucretius wrote that there must be other planets occupied by other tribes of men and other breeds of beasts. As we can see, it was about 2,500 years ago that the belief in extraterrestrial life really took off. Even as we learn more about our universe, we keep asking ourselves the same questions. I want to give a big shout out to Bubbles Activated and Tyronel. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe for more videos about history and amazing discoveries. Roman Superstitions the ancient Romans believed in a lot of strange superstitions and were responsible for many traditions that are still practiced today. For example, it was in ancient Rome when the tradition of the groom carrying his new bride over the threshold of their home was invented. Romans believed that if a new bride tripped as she entered the house for the first time, the spirits would grow furious and the marriage would be doomed. These were domestic spirits called penates that could ruin lives and so, to prevent angering the spirits, husbands began carrying their brides inside so that they wouldn't trip. It's a practice that survived all the way until now. One of the weirder things the Romans did was try to see into the future by watching birds and it was called augury. Special priests called augurs would watch birds to see what they did, and then would predict divine future events from that. Romans believed that the behavior of birds was a direct reflection of the god's will. 
The future could be determined by carefully watching what birds were up to. This was such a firm belief that there were whole priesthoods dedicated to watching birds. Whenever a Roman leader was going to do something important, the first step was to seek the help of an augur. The augur could supposedly tell the future based on what the local birds had been doing at the time. The Origin of Fairies The belief in fairies started a long time ago and was very different from what it is today. In the Neolithic period, which ended only 4,400 years ago in Western Europe, ancestor worship was extremely common. The Celtic and Germanic tribes would typically bury the human remains of their revered ancestors, tribal leaders, chieftains, heroes, and great warriors, in large mounds of earth. Some scholars believe that most European deities began as simple campfire stories of brave men during the Neolithic times. Then, as the years went on and the stories were retold and reshaped, these heroes turned into deities, gods, and legends. At some point, the bodies buried inside of these mounds were largely forgotten. People knew there was something buried, but so many centuries had gone by that their identity was lost. And so, stories started being told of the spirits of the mounds, known as elves and fairies. Fairies were not winged beings with magic wands, but rather the spirits of the unknown dead. In ancient times, there was no real difference between ghosts, fairies, or elves. These were all just different words used to describe spirits of dead relatives relatives living in a kind of shadow realm, and people used to believe that the fairy world existed just underneath the fabric of our own realm. Mount Etna In the 5th century BC, there was a Greek philosopher named Empedocles of Akragas. He believed, like many ancient Greeks, that Mount Etna was the home of the gods. This mountain is one of the most active volcanoes in the world, and it's been spitting up lava and smoke for at least 2.5 million years. Throughout the centuries, Mount Etna has been at the center of a lot of Greek beliefs. It was supposedly the home of the fire-breathing monster called Typhon, who was trapped underneath the mountain by Zeus himself. It was also supposed to be home to Hephaestus, the blacksmith of the gods. The Romans called him Vulcan and worshipped him as the ultimate master metalworker. Nobody is really sure why, but at some point Empedocles of Akragas went a little bit insane. He believed himself to be a god, or at least endowed with the powers of a god. To prove his godliness to his jealous colleagues, he climbed to the top of Mount Etna and jumped inside. Suffice to say, Empedocles was never seen again. Pokong Pokongs are supernatural beings of Indonesia that are believed to be the spirits of the dead. Traditional belief says that the soul of a dead person stays on earth inside their body for 40 days after their death. When someone dies in Indonesia, they must be wrapped in a burial shroud known as a kind coffin. During the next 40 days, the ghostly spirit of the dead is then contained within the shroud. However, if the shroud is not untied at the appropriate time, the spirit becomes restless and desperate to escape. Only when the shroud has been untied can the spirit flee the earthly realm forever. The belief in Pokongs has been around for centuries, and people still believe in them to this day. They truly think the spirits of the dead remain lurking about until the proper rituals have been done to allow them to rest. Some of these spirits get lost, and some are even said to form colonies. There are urban legends in rural Indonesia about entire colonies of spirits that hang out in banana trees, and nobody knows why. The Stork The belief in storks as bringers of babies came about over 600 years ago in medieval times. Storks have likely been associated with birth and fertility as far back as ancient Egypt, although back then it was believed the world was born by a magical heron. It was in the medieval days in Europe that the belief in storks bringing physical babies took shape. During pagan times in Germany and Norway, many couples got married during the annual summer solstice. Summer was the perfect time to get married, so that was typically when babies would start baking in the proverbial oven. Nine months later, in the midst of spring, most of these babies would be born. Coincidentally, storks had a very similar schedule. In the summer, storks began their annual migration. They flew from Europe to Africa and then returned exactly nine months later. This is why people began associating the return of the storks with the baby boom of spring. Rachel Warren Chad, who helped write a book on the subject, says the story then grew in complexity. 
The stork in Norse mythology became a symbol for family values and purity, and as the world became more Christianized and certain subjects became taboo, the storks continued to serve a purpose. Religious parents told their children that the storks delivered babies to avoid having to talk about the real biological creation of life. This spawned entire generations who believed storks delivered babies by some stroke of magic. Thanks for watching! How much do you think your soul weighs? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to hit that subscribe button and I'll see you soon. Bye!